Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. This is a long text, so if you get tired, you may sit down. Um, so listen now for God's word to you. And Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my inheritance that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the young son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in riotous living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. And so he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to, said to the slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. And the slave replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. And then the brother became angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and begged and began to plead him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me a, even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. 
But this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and he has come to life. He was lost and has been found. May the Lord bless unto us the reading of the scriptures. To God be glory, dominion, and might, world without end. Amen. Will you please be seated? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My grandmother on my father's side had a number of axioms that she would share with me from time to time. One was, visitors are like fish. They began to stink after three days. Another one of her favorites was familiarity breeds contempt. Or I might put it a little more nicely, perhaps familiarity breeds a tendency to take for granted things and people. Now my first granny axiom was for grins because it has nothing to do with the text, but the second one has a lot to do with the text. We know the text of the prodigal son so well. We're talking about vacation Bible school, Sunday school. We learned it from the time we were very small. We call it the prodigal son. But Ralph Waldo Emerson and Charles Dickens called this particular story the greatest story ever told in the scriptures. There are subtleties hidden in this master story of Jesus. And at first glance, they're not quite apparent. We are so familiar with the story, we just briefly read over it. As a matter of fact, everyone knew how it ended when I started, didn't you? But I'd like to step back and look at it closely. Perhaps we have not realized the full impact of the request that the younger son is making. Give me my inheritance. This would be like saying to your parents right now, or like I would perhaps said to mine when they were living, give me one half of, well, there were four of us, so it'd be one quarter right now, because I need it. I know you're not quite dead, but you will be one day. So, fork it over. We can pretend that you died. The younger son doesn't really care that his father is still living. Give me the money and I will leave this place. I can tell you, it still happens today. The heirs of an estate before the person passes away, siphoning off 
different things out of that estate. It happens frequently. And the parent hasn't even died. They're stealing from the estate and stealing perhaps from the other heirs. It's despicable. I've had so many experiences with this as a pastor for so long. I had to call an attorney to have, as soon as the person died, have the locks changed so a daughter wouldn't get in there and take everything valuable before they could take an account of what the fullness of the estate was. I have a litany of horror stories. Give me the money. And along with that, the son is actually saying to the father, you are only worth to me what you own. Can you imagine if your children said that to you? How torn up you would be? You're not a human being. You're an ATM machine. I don't care anything about you. All I care about is what you own. But let's dig a little deeper. And this story is in an agrarian context agricultural society. The value that the father has is not in the number of coins he has in the bank. It is, in fact, in the value of the land and the livestock that he owns. So where's the cash? In order to do what the younger son is asking, he must go out and sell half of the land and half of the livestock. This would reduce the amount of income for the father and the oldest son by 50%. There is no concern about their future from the youngest son's point of view. We also understand why the older son gets angry, don't we? Furthermore, it's a rejection of the way of life that the father is living. We can put it in terms of ranching terms. We're here in Texas. You're a rancher, Father. I got bigger dreams than being on a ranch. You can waste your time with cattle, camels, and cackling chickens, but it's not good enough for me. There's a whole sermon in that, but... The father's life is not good enough. We can go back to the Garden of Eden. But I won't do that today. You can waste your life, but I've got bigger plans. What an insult to that father. Do you see the gravity of the request by the younger son. The father's way is just not good enough. And if we are honest, if we are truly honest, when the younger son is slopping pigs as low as a Jewish boy could go, feeding 
animals that are prohibited by Mosaic law, if we're truly honest, he deserves it. He's getting what he deserves. As a matter of fact, he is no better than the pigs he swaps. And now we understand the older son's reaction, don't we? The father throws a banquet. And we understand why the older son won't go in. Oh, Jesus is very tricky when he's telling these stories. It is too real, too pointed in a way. In our real world, we would say what happened to the older son is not fair. It is not equitable. That his own pettiness, his own spiteful nature, his own sense of self-righteousness and jealousy, why, we could justify that. And if the younger son should ever show up, he deserves to be a slave, and I'd put him back, except the father doesn't own any pigs, I'd put him back cleaning out the chicken pens. But to make him an heir again? See, that's what that symbolizes, putting on the best rope and a ring on his finger. He's now an heir again. And I imagine the older son's anger and hostility towards his younger brother has been never far from his thoughts. That son had been left behind to work like a slave to keep the ranch afloat because 50% of it had been spent in riotous living by this younger son. I suspect that not one day passed where the older son, if he met his younger brother on the street, he would have beaten him senseless if there was any sense left in him. But I put to you, this parable is about God's grace. And I would even put to you, and this is the disturbing part, that both brothers are living in a far country. <laughs> One theologian wrote of this, and I'll quote, I pity the poor father who has to live at home, at, in a home with conspicuous vices and conspicuous virtue. Perhaps it's the father who should have run away and left the place for the other two to fight it out. You see, the younger brother did not care for the father's love. And the older brother felt that he had earned and deserved the father's love. This is a story about grace, folks. And what is grace? It is God's love in action. It's not some grand concept, a Greek concept, even though Greeks help us. But it's when God's love is in action. That's grace. Dr. Robert Durham, the senior pastor at University Presbyterian Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, he preached on this particular text. And he was surprised 
Uh, you can tell this happened pre-COVID. He was standing out there greeting people, and not a few came out and said, you know, I find that uh, sermon very uncomfortable. Others would say, you know, but what about cheap grace? If you don't link it, link it to repentance, it's just cheap. One man came out and said, I will certainly be glad when you stop preaching about grace and start preaching about repentance. Repentance is the precursor to grace. Now you know why I don't stand out there anymore. So the question before us this morning is a simple one. Which comes first? Grace or repentance? Now, formally, I've even taken this tack, and today I, something hit me, not today, during this week preparation. Some believe the younger son actually repented while he was out there slopping the pigs. But the story says, Even my slaves in my father's house have food. Here I am starving. I know what I'll do. I'll go tell my father that I have sinned against heaven and against him. And at least I'll be fed and have a roof over my head. You see, he hadn't repented. He was still thinking of his own survival. And he sets up this elaborate scheme to keep himself from starving. And then the beautiful phrase, and while he was still far off. It makes one think the father was always looking to that hill. That hill that you would come over and see the whole ranch. Every day he glanced hopefully to see a figure coming. And when he sees him, he runs. Now let me tell you something. A landed gentry don't run. They may walk slowly, nobly, head held high, but they don't run. But this father runs. And he runs up to his son and puts his arms around him and kisses him. And the son says, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I think it is there. The scheme is falling apart in the face of this wonderful love of the Father. That's the repentance. Because the text goes on to say he was dead but now he is alive and those words have new meaning he throws the son a party and the older son won't even go in But the father leaves the guest. The younger son. And he goes. Goes out. To play.
plead with the older son. Notice, he runs, he goes out. God's love is action. I do not believe you will find in the scripture that repentance is a prerequisite to love and action we call grace. Repentance is a response to that love, to that grace. It is the love that is the catalyst that moves us into repentance. And the scriptures say we love because God loved us first. As a matter of fact, I think repentance is grace. Oh, what? No! Repentance means offering a new path, a new way of living, a greater way of living than the way you're living at the moment. That's grace. That's love in action. Unmerited, unearned. It goes far beyond what we in our normal world would call equity. Or fairness. Repentance. Is acceptance of who that person. We were meant to be. In love whether it comes to us in the pigsty or whether it comes to us out by the fireside outside of the party. That's how God approaches us. God moves. As a matter of fact, the entire reconciliation process is grace. It is grace that the younger son has a place to come home. It is grace that while he is still far off, the father runs. It is grace that the father leaves the party to tell his son you were with me. You see, we see this in the cross of Jesus Christ. It is grace that initiates our repentance. It is love that initiates our repentance. We don't repent and then get loved. No, God is so far ahead of us. But we don't know about the older son. And Jesus leaves us dangling in the wood, wind. Did he go in? Or did his hatred eat him from the inside out? And we leave this marvelous parable asking two questions. What kind of love is this? And what kind of God is this?
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, <laughs>